Okay. Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce a, a friend and collaborator and a mentor. Uh, Dr. Yanis Kevrekidis is a, a world leading expert on uh, nonlinear dynamics and machine learning methods for nonlinear dynamics. Um, Yanis studied chemical engineering at the National Technical University of Athens. Which has some other good students. Right, that he then followed the steps of many <laughs> good students there. And uh, he moved to the University of Minnesota, where he studied with Rutherford Harris and Lani Smith, as well as Don Arson and Dick Mahi in math. He was a director's fellow at the Center for Nonlinear Studies in Los Alamos in 1985 to 1986 when Soviets still existed and research funds were plentiful. He then had the good fortune of joining the faculty at Princeton where he taught chemical engineering and also applied in computational mathematics for 31 years. Seven years ago, he became emeritus and started fresh at George Hopkins University. Uh, he wor his work always had to do with nonlinear dynamics from instabilities and bifurcations to spatiotemporal patterns, to data science in the 90s, nonlinear identification, multi-scale modeling, and back to data science and machine learning. He had the additional good fortune to work with several truly talented experimentalists like uh, Ertl's group in Berlin. When young and promising, he was a Packard Fellow, a presidential young investigator, and the Ulam Scholar at Los Alamos um, National Laboratory. He holds the Colburn, Cast, Wilhelm, and Walker Awards of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, oh, yeah. the Crawford and the Reed Prizes of Siam. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering, Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Academy of Athens. He, he, he asked me well, for a short bio. I sent it to him, but he actually <laughs> read it. So that's why Thank I started you. a few minutes earlier, but we <laughs> look you. forward to your talk. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here again. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I have a slightly weird title, I have to kind of explain it, but to what I want to, to give you is some old and some new thoughts on, on data and modeling complex systems. And uh, there are some MIT connections uh, in this. Um, I will kind of take some time at the beginning of the talk to tell you about some of the old stuff. Um, you know how they say, ah, said the old professor, all of this is wrong and I published it first anyway. So there will be a little bit of this. Um, this is a paper from 100 years ago, uh, 1992. It has a very strange title, Discrete versus Continuous Time Nonlinear Signal Processing of Copper Electrode Dissolution Data. It's based on experiments done in the lab of Jack Hudson over there. And uh, what this was about was having data that depended on time and parameters. And then the idea was to try and somehow extract dynamical equations to reproduce the data. Not, not learn the physics, extract dynamical equations to reproduce the data. So what you see up there is time series, constant time series, oscillatory time series, messier oscillatory time series. They are all for different parameter values. These parameter values had to do with taking a piece of copper, putting it in hydrochloric acid, having a counter electrode, and then looking at the rate of dissolution, the corrosion as it was sold at the time. And then what you see here is the delay reconstructions of the time series, steady states, limit cycles, period doublings. You look here, period quadruplings. As Temis told you, I always was a nonlinear dynamics kind of person, and then chaotic stuff. And so the question is, how do you get, um, how, how do you, how can you extract a model from the data that is capable of reproducing these? What we really cared about was the bifurcations between different states. Now, in what I told you, we had a single measurement. It was just the, the solution rate. And to get chaotic dynamics, you need at least three, right? So the question is, how do we find the right variables in which to write our model? And this has to do with what, uh, I mean, here's the word variable free. Uh, how do we find good latent spaces based on the observations in which we can represent the data and learn the dynamical equation? Where do good variables come from? From systematic hierarchy, somebody gives you a cloud of points, then it's a distribution, you use enough moments of the distribution. Or maybe you know people that are extremely smart, have a lot of experience, and they know how to focus on particular observations out of many. 
if you want, it's possible to also do it with quite interesting and difficult math. I mean, there's people that know how to go from the Boltzmann equation to the Navier-Stokes, but also from experience, we know that we could use equations at the level of velocity field. So it can come from a lot of information. It can come from either human or, if you want, mathematical experience. And then in the last 20 years, it can also come from data science. We can look at the data and then find good descriptors of the data. And then we learn the equations in terms of those descriptors. Principal components is something that's been around for 150 years. Here we go from three-dimensional data to two-dimensional data. And then um, around 2000, 2000, there were two back-to-back -back papers in Science magazine that, that, uh, that, that had uh, local linear embedding and isomap. So that was, to my knowledge, the first time that systematically one might extract not just parametrizations of hyperplanes, but parametrizations of low dimensional manifolds. And uh, my particular poison in manifold learning and finding parametrizations of data that live on manifolds is diffusion maps. I work with Rafi Koifman. Um, and I'm just saying that you formulate an eigenproblem. And for example, for data that are live in three dimensions, but are two dimensional, like the Swiss roll data, the result of the eigenproblem is the decision of what's the dimension of your data and what is the parametrization of the dimension of your data. What's the point? The point is you get high dimensional data like that. You want to learn evolution rules. First, you have to have a good parametrization of the data. And here is the problem that I told you before. We only had a single time series. So how did we get a good space in which to learn the equations? And this is one of the MIT vignettes. So this is a guy called Mark Kramer, who was a professor in chemical engineering, who I don't know if you remember him at all, Professor Strong. He, uh, he didn't get tenure. He has done fine in life, so it's okay. But, but, but one of the things that he did is that he published in 1991 in the American Institute of Chemical Engineering Journals, a paper on something that he called nonlinear principal components, which is what we kind of know today as autoencoders, getting from high dimensional data through a bottleneck neural network back to the high dimensional data. If this works, then you have an encoder from high to low dimension, and then you don't lose any information. You go back to the entire information. Um, so for us, what we did is that we took long windows of time series, and from long windows of time series, we got lower dimensional descriptors, and then we learned the equations in terms of these descriptors. Um, this is another interesting thing from exactly, again, back then. So th this is a, I think I've even made some typos somewhere, but this, this is a Runge Kuta, a fourth order explicit Runge Kuta. You take uh, an initial condition, you calculate F at the initial condition, you take this, multiply it with some simple function of the time step, add to the initial condition, calculate F again. And you do this again and again and again. And in the end, you find the solution in the span of these intermediate function evaluations. So what we did in 1992 is that we put down, I don't even want to say created, we put down a neural network architecture. So this was the time of uh, shallow multilayer perceptions. So we put down a neural network architecture, which takes an initial condition passes it through a net, get K1, multiplies with a small number, adds it to the initial condition, passes it through the same net. There is four iterations through the network. So this is a recurrent network. And then in the end, exactly like the Runge Kuta, you don't find the output as a function of the input, the next time step as a function of the previous time step, but you learn the difference. And the difference lives in the span of all of these Ks. So, I would like to, maybe one way to say is, oh, gee, we discovered recurrent residual networks. But that would not be exactly true, because if you think about it, the Runge Kuta is a recurrent residual process. And this is one of the things that I'm going to say a few times through the talk. I kind of really believe that if we look at the architectures that people come up with in the discussion of successful use of neural networks, many of them I would like to think all of them, but I could be wrong. They really, if you look at them carefully, they are the numerical analysis algorithms that we know and love. And, and, and maybe just because 
Professor Strand came, I would say that if one looks about it a little bit, you would see that the Runge Kuta evaluates a function and then evaluates a perturbed function and then yet another perturbation. So it looks a little bit like a GM res. You're doing nearby function evaluations and then you can evaluate directional derivatives and then you can use all these directional derivatives to, to find the solution. That's another numerical analysis maybe undercurrent in this. This is the paper for ResNets. Uh, from the paper of Resnets, of course, it was much, but the idea is that you take an initial condition, you pass it through a network, and then you multiply it with something and you add to what you had before. And it's pretty clear that this is forward Euler for us or for those that do integration. And uh, that was in 2015. And so by taking the time series, finding good latent spaces with autoencoders, and then using this recurrent resonance to learn the right-hand side of the equation, to approximate the right-hand side of the equation, we were able to create an autonomous parameter-dependent dynamical system where we could do the bifurcation analysis, find the first instability and the period doublings and so on and so forth. There's an extra twist in this. It's a long story and I don't have time to say it, but let me also say, it's very important not to learn the time one map. It's very important to learn the right-hand side of the equation because the bifurcations of discrete time dynamical systems are completely different from the bifurcations of continuous time dynamical systems. So discrete time dynamical systems don't have period doublings, for example. This is just a little twist. But what I wanted to say is again, that the main idea is find latent spaces and then use numerical analysis to construct neural network architectures that allow you to learn data-driven equations. This is all completely black box. And we did other things back then. By that time, you realize mid nineties, nobody cared about neural networks anymore. So this is a different architecture, which is an implicit network. If you look at it carefully, you will see that it is the trapezoidal rule, Crank Nicholson. And so there is lots and lots of different interesting neural network architectures that come from the numerical analysis we know and love. And this is maybe an interesting little twist. So uh, what we learn is not the dynamical system. We're learning an approximation of the dynamical system. And this, the name is backward error analysis. So what you see here is if you, if you have a system and then this is a numerical simulation of the system, and this is the true solution of the system. Forward error analysis has to do with the difference between the true solution and the numerical solution. Typical backward error analysis is, let me find a so-called modified differential equation whose true solution passes from my numerics. Then, and this now fits with identification with neural networks, what is done is another version of backward error analysis, inverse modified differential equations. What we do is that what the Runge Kuta finds is a right-hand side whose numerical solution passes from the true time series. So there is again a framework for studying the, how close this inverse modified differential equation appro app approximates the true problem. And we did other things back then. We played with gray boxes. So if, if in some equations I know a whole bunch of terms well, then in the Runge Kuta, I can just put the part that I know. It's important to be learning right-hand sides, not time one maps to be able to do that. And we also played um, with distributed dynamical systems. What you see up there, this is a paper from, God help me, 1993, I think. Uh, you, you had movies from a catalytic reaction happening on the surface of a catalyst. The colors that you see correspond to concentration of oxygen in red and carbon monoxide in blue. And again, the idea is you want to find the reasonable latent space. So we did principal components up there. We found that things can be boiled down to four principal components in space. Therefore, the whole movie could be described by four time series. And then by using shallow perceptrons, we were able to approximate the right-hand side of the PDE on this low dimensional manifold that was parametrized by four principal component modes. And these are the attractors experimentally. They're a bit more noisy than the ones predicted. And other, so this is around, I think, 94. This was, I'm showing it because it's kind of fancier. The experiments were 
Rayleigh Bernard Convection in Liquid Helium with Bob Ecke in Los Alamos, where I was a postdoc. And um, what you see is Poincaré maps from a quasi-periodic behavior. And again, what one gets is the time one evolution on the Poincaré map as a function of the Rayleigh number. And then you can do bifurcation calculations as a function of the Rayleigh number. If you ever played with quasi-periodic systems, they have all kinds of resonances and frequency lockings. And uh, then another thing from the distant past, everything I showed you here was finite dimensional, either maps or differential or ordinary differential equation. This is partial differential equation. So this is identifying the right-hand side an approximation to the right-hand side of a parabolic partial differential equation. This is the time derivative. And if you think of the formulas, like a reaction diffusion problem, in a reaction diffusion problem, the time derivative everywhere in space and time is a function of the solution and the second spatial derivative of the solution and parameters. So if you have a movie, at every point of the space-time movie, we can get what this is, what this is, and what this is. And then using the usual fitting technology that neural network allows us, we can try and approximate the partial differential equation right-hand side operator. So I'm showing this to again make a point about an architecture. Look, think of finite differences. We take a little stencil, we use the points in the stencil to estimate derivatives, and then we try to fit the time derivative as a function of the variable and space derivative. And then what do we do? We take the stencil and we slide it by one, do the same thing, slide it by one, do the same thing, and so it kind of becomes an obvious realization that finite differences are a sort of convolutional neural networks. They are paying attention on a small part of the domain at the time. And so what we did is that we combined discrete data in space with finite differences, if you want convolution, and then discrete data in time using these recurrent runge kuta resonance that I told you, and tried and, and got black boxes that reproduced what the partial differential equation was producing. Uh, in the same spirit, this is a current paper, a couple of years, I don't know, four years ago at, at Archive that we wrote. But the idea is the same idea. If here I don't want to approximate an ODE or a PDE, but I want to approximate an SDE, then I want a neural network that tries to fit the right hand sides, but the loss of the neural network is based on numerical analysis. You're asking, what if the data were produced by an Euler Maruyama? What if the data were produced by a Milstein method? What the data were produced by a Hoyne implicit method? And what you do is that you create loss functions that are based on numerical analysis, that are based on what would the right-hand side be that if you integrated it with a traditional stochastic numerical integrator would give you these data. And the last thing before I get to something more present, this is something that's close to my heart. I'm playing with now a lot and I will not kind of talk very much about it, but in what I showed you from 1992, this is a network that has kind of two sets of structure. There is this multi-layer perceptron that's sitting in there with its parameters to be trained. But then there is a sort of superstructure that has fixed connections and fixed weights. Like in Arunga Kuta, you pass through once, and then here you multiply with h over 2. So in this problem, the black connections in the network are prescribed by the algorithm. The red functions are to be found. You can kind of flip this around. You can take a known function, but then ask, how should I combine the function evaluations and with what recurrence and with what weights to also get the same result? So in this case, you know the integrator and find the function. In these cases, you know the function and try to find the integrator. And that's also an interesting thing, the discovery of algorithms. You may know if you've been looking at this, that in the last two years, there is just for deep mind from deep mind there's two papers about discovering better algorithm multiplications and better sort sorting algorithms so the idea is use the machinery and optimization in order to find better algorithms for something okay now more kind of close to the present i'm I, the, unfortunately the clock is not over there it's behind me so i have to look in the back 
So this is something that is much closer to, to this is one of the things that, that, that my group works on these days. Uh, we spend a lot of time on trying to find a good latent space for the variables that we are observing. And I want to get you to think of space in cases in which you do not know what the right space in which you plot your data is. This is an example. Uh, bear with me, I will describe it. It's a lovely paper. I only found about it a couple of years ago. It's a paper from, I think, 2013 in Science. Is it? 2013. It says, the hidden geometry of complex network-driven contagion phenomena. This was the previous SARS, not COVID. And what they did is that they looked at the evolution in time. Look, this is the Earth in 41 days, 51 days. 62 days, 72 days of the progression of the disease. And it looks messy, you will agree with me. But then what they did is that they took the earth and they took into account the flights and the airports and the right connectivity. And basically what they did is that they distorted the earth so that places that were close were places that were easy to get to, yes? And if you look at the progression of this in the distorted Earth, you will agree with me that it makes very much sense, right? It looks like a concentric wave that's growing from, which suggests that true geography may not be the best way of plotting, understanding, modeling what is that you're looking at. Maybe you need to distort the geometry so that the behavior is more beautiful in the geometry that you will construct. So construct emergent spaces, not true geography, but emergent spaces that if you want are in harmony with what you're looking at, with what happens in them. This, uh, this is just me being playful. Nikos Kazantzakis is a, is a writer and kind of, you know, early 20th, mid 20th century intellectual. He has this very nice uh, line says, since we cannot change reality, let us at least change the eyes with which we look at reality. And if you want, the idea is these are streamlines, chaotic streamlines from a steady ABC flow. Uh, could I transform them, do a flow box for them? Can I transform them in a space in which everything is simple and beautiful? I work in this space and then I take the results back to physical space. It's just dreaming, just, you know. Ah, one more of these. This is uh, Dora Mar, who was one of Picasso's muses. This is how Picasso thought of her. This is how Man Ray photographed her. Out of all possible transformations of something, if you wanted to tell your friends about Dora Mar, would you choose this? Would you choose that? Which one would you choose? So in 2011, I think, DARPA had this challenge. They called it the Shredder Challenge. They took five documents and they shredded them into pieces and they put the pieces on the web and offered $50,000 for whoever would reconstruct them in two months. A few days before the two months, a company in California reconstructed all five. If you give it to your graduate students, or if you're graduate students, it'll take you now half an hour to do this. And people were wondering at the time if it is impossible. So let me give you my view of this. This is a Ginsburg Landau, some sort of partial differential equation in one space dimension and time. You see patterns of, of concentration, if you want, on it. So what you do is that you take this PDE solution as it comes out of the printer, and you take it to the office, which during the COVID years, I couldn't give this talk because we don't go to the office. And then you shred it. You pass it through a shredder. And then what you get out of the series is, 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 is 512 time series. You mix them up. You take the picture and make a puzzle out of it. Yes, you just break it into pieces. And now, if you try and learn a partial differential equation in this data, it will look nuts. But if you take each of these time series and consider each of them as a data point, and then you look at smoothness, you analyze your data points and you look for smoothness, nearby points should be look nearby, then what you do is that you recover the original space. You find a new emergent space, which is one-to-one -one with the original one. Actually, if you are very careful, and that's why I put the black lines, you actually find the flipped one. Because if you find your two neighbors, your two closest neighbors, 
you don't know who to put on the right and who to put on the left. So it's modular reflection. So I, I hope I'm making my point. You take this, you shred it. Yes, these look like a mess, but they really are a one parameter family of time series. If you did principal components, or if you put them through an autoencoder, you would find that there is one independent variable. If you sort them based on this one independent variable, then you get a good space, a right space, a data-driven space, an emergent space that in which the behavior is beautiful. Beautiful here is smooth, yes? And now, instead of trying to learn rules in this space, you try and learn rules in that one. And now I'm going to show you the one of the two good things I brought to show you today. This is a bunch of oscillators. This comes from the work of Steve Strogat. This is late 80s or something like that. There is 800 oscillators. They are now here sitting at their initial conditions. They are not just, for those of you that play with oscillators, they're not just frequency oscillators. They're frequency and amplitude oscillators. Their coupling depends on X and Y. They're all coupled together. And each one of them is slightly different. You see the color? The color kind of corresponds to their difference, how they are intrinsically different. It's like you have lots of people in a city, and you happen to know who is rich and who is a little poorer and who is poor, without kind of you know have, having that tattooed on their forehead. And then what you do is that you look at the behavior of these as they interact and run. And what I want you to see is that they organize themselves along a one-dimensional curve where the blues and the reds remain with the same order as the behavior goes. That is, it kind of makes more sense not to look at the behavior of these guys as a function of X and Y, but rather try and look at it as a function of the arc length of this curve. If you plot things in terms of the arc length of this curve, then you will see that it kind of starts looking like a partial differential equation. It has some singularities as it goes on in space. But the point is, instead of looking at what everybody does as a function of space and time, you can discover in a data-driven way a coordinate in which the behavior looks nice, is beautiful, is smoother. And then you try and learn the equation in that space. So. This is exactly the same thing. Here is all the oscillators. They are colored by their initial condition. You let them go in time. They organize themselves in this one dimensional curve. But if you try and look at the behavior in terms of the original color, in terms of where they started, it looks like a horrible function. Here's the whole point. You take the behavior of all of these oscillators. It looks like a mess of spaghetti. And then you data mine the behavior and you discover that there exists a coordinate, which is a data-driven, I, I know, I've, okay, emergent maybe sounds pretentious. It's a pretty standard word, I understand, in physics for creating such data-driven spaces. And then in this data-driven space, the behavior looks like something that is nice and smooth. You, you decide what is nice. You decide the beauty. Here, beauty is smoothness. And now that we have embedded things in a latent space where the behavior is smooth, now we can try and learn a partial differential equation for the evolution of what the oscillators are doing in this emergent coordinates. So basically, I'm telling you about the one of the two things I want to tell you is latent spaces for the independent variables, space, time. And it just works nicely. This is a parameter in the interaction of the oscillators. This is a bifurcation diagram. Here, they all kind of organize themselves at a statistical steady state, more or less with small fluctuations. And then there is a bifurcation to space-time oscillatory solution. And now this is kind of a little bit of an entry in my next vignette. I learned a formula for a partial differential equation. It's just a black box fitting, OK? No, no claims for physics. But if you have an equation, you have a PDE, and you want to solve it, you need some sort of boundary conditions. And this partial differential equation is hidden in a, in a black box neural network. How do I decide what are sufficient or good boundary conditions for solving such a problem? 
My second vignette is in data-driven well-posedness. Here, what we did is that we took little corridors at the edge of the domain and used the little corridors. If you are prescribing a little corridor, you are prescribing the value and the first and the second and the third and a whole bunch of derivatives. I'm not saying that this is correct. I just want to tell you, you learn something black box, what would make it a well-posed problem? It is not obviously clear. This is something that we were quite proud of when we did it. In the problems that I told you before, I showed you a problem where there was geometry and I messed it up myself. I showed you a problem where I knew from looking at the behavior that there was going to be some convenient one-dimensional geometry. This is a problem that comes from looking at a network. It's a neuronal network. It's like each neuron here is a bunch of Hodgkin-Huxley equations. So there's 1,024 coupled Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. But, but this is a messy network. This is very heterogeneous. Uh, everybody is slightly different kinetically. And then everybody, they're not connected all to all. This is a chung Lu network for the aficionados. It, 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 there is a variation on the number of how many neurons on average everybody is connected with. Different neurons are connected with different numbers of other neurons. You look at their behavior. They are synchronized, so they are all oscillating, but everybody does a slightly different oscillation. That's why you have this smudge. There's, there is 1,024 limit cycles there. You analyze these 1,024 limit cycles, and you find that it's a two-parameter family of limit cycles. They have two principal components, two nonlinear principal components, two layer auto two, two neuron autoencoders or two diffusion map coordinates. And in this space, in this space that is data driven, it comes from looking at the behavior, not from looking at the network. Every point is a neuron. And when in this space, the neurons are nearby, then their behavior is close to each other. So this very messy network can be thought of as a discretization of a nice two-dimensional chunk of R2. And we can go and instead of learning the evolution equations on a network of 10,000 of 1,024 nodes, we can do 10 finite elements in this emergent data-driven space. One little thing about interpretability. It's not on purpose, but it's easy in this problem. You do find that there are two emergent coordinates in which it makes sense to look. You understand the network is like a random discretization of a nice two-dimensional domain. Now, the thing is, we take these coordinates and we color them by the chemical heterogeneity of the network of each one of the neurons. And lo and behold, phi 1, the first data-driven coordinate, seems to be one-to-one -one with a physically interpretable thing how different they are chemically. And lo and behold, it, it looks really cooked up, but no, we were just lucky. If you color the data by the degree of a neuron in the network, it turns out that the second coordinate is the heterogeneity in the degree. So here we were lucky, we found two things, and we could kind of even kind of explain, or at least have an interpretation of what are the two dimensions. It's a parametrization of the heterogeneity of the network in which it makes sense to try and analyze things. And what we did is that we went and learned the partial differential equation in this space of the two diffusion map coordinates of the behavior. And what you see there is an integration of a PDE in an emergent space that we didn't know at the beginning that we got from data. It's not anything amazing, but it's interesting to consider that you might want to sculpt the space in which you're going to learn the model so that the behavior in this space is nicer than the spaghetti of the 10,024 neurons, 1,024. And in what I told you so far, I took, think of it, this is a partial differential equation. And then what I do is that I take the partial differential equation and I mess up space. So I, you know, horizontal is space and vertical is time. I mess up space, and then I also mess up time. In what I told you, I told you, look for smoothness and recover the a good ordering in space. The same idea also holds for time. You can take a movie, cut it in snippets, 
and then try and put them in the right order. That's also the same kind of puzzle philosophy. As a matter of fact, when I started first working on this 10 years ago, there was a company in California and you, if you found a bunch of pictures in your grandmother's drawer, you could send it to them and then they would put them in the right chronological order for you by looking for smoothness in the evolution. I doubt that they would still exist. So the idea is that if you have something that looks messy, then use, I don't know how to say, data science if you want, to find a space-time set of coordinates in which the behavior would look what you consider as beautiful. And then you work in that space. This is something that happens also a lot for those of you, for example, that play with Koopman operators or hear about them. Let me find the space in which the behavior is linear. Let me find the space in which the behavior is integrable. Let me find the space in which the behavior is Hamiltonian. Okay? It's an interesting proposition. This is trying to make a little bit of a physical example of what I was telling you, because I sent the paper to Nature Communications, and then they said, this is very nice, but it's very unphysical. Like, can you think of any physical example where this could happen? And at the time, I did not know about the, the, the epidemic example, which was nice. So because I'm a chemical engineer by training and, and also by conviction sometimes, I thought, well, think of that table. That table is, I don't know, this is Texas, a, some county in Texas. And then there is a reservoir that goes under the county. And what you do is that you have a whole bunch of sensors and you measure what the sensors at different wells tell you. But you see the geometry of the sensors is the geometry of the surface of, you know, one, two, you know, this is close to, six is close to two, one is close to two, and three is close to two. But in terms of the reservoir, three is not close to two. So the obvious geometry, which is the physical geometry of the county in Texas, is not the geometry of the behavior. So if you take the behavior and plot them in terms of physical geography up there, then you get a function that's horrible. It has a very bad Dirichlet energy. But you can rearrange the space. And if you rearrange in a data-driven way the space, then you do get something that has the right order or the right geometry. And then you can learn advection diffusion or easily solve it in the data-driven space. And I thought of doing some cute example. I mean, maybe a typical example is of the same nature is think of somebody's intestines. If you measure things in a space-time grid in three dimensions, in a space grid in three dimensions, um, that's not the right geometry for looking at what flows through an intestine. And there's lots of very interesting problems that happen if you look at the, you know, when an embryo divides, what is the right geometry in which to look at things? It's not the geometry of physical space in which, you know, the new cells come out and live. Overall, the same idea. What's the, what is the right Latin space for the independent variables? What's the space in which I would look at the behavior? So that's one. Now I look up here and I have, I think, enough time. That was my one vignette, emergent spaces. The second vignette, I already mentioned this, is thinking of uh, well-posedness. The main point is, if you have formulas, then you can look at the equation and try and figure out, you know, is it parabolic? Is it, you know, does it have conservation laws or not? But if you have a black box, then how do you do that? And so I'm going to... The way that this started was uh, George Kanyadakis, who is a friend, uh, at some point thought of using neural networks as basis functions for solving partial differential equations. He called them pins, physically informed neural networks. And so what you see here is a space time box for the Kuramoto Sivashinsky, which is an equation that I have lived, breathed, and whatever for 30 years since I was a postdoc. So this is space and this is time. You can kind of see a modulated traveling wave going through. It has something to do with flames and something to do with shallow water waves since we are in an ocean, partly oceanogra oceanographic department. And um, this is, we are trying to solve in this part of the domain and we have data on this part, data on this part and data on this part. You can kind of recognize when I say I have data I am kind of implicitly thinking of what is a good way of giving data-driven boundary conditions. Why is this interesting? Uh, this is interesting because these days, there is a lovely paper by Adamach in, in a, for some reason in the Princeton Bulletin or something at the end of the 
19th century. And it says, the geometers tell us we solve problems with Dirichlet and Neumann, and maybe it doesn't say about Robin boundary conditions. But somehow the suggestion is we don't think of problems very much that have different kinds of boundary conditions. And these days, if you think of how we get data, for example, those of you that play with data assimilation, we may get data in a very nice and coherent way that would be good boundary conditions for the middle, or we can get data in some space-time chunks or in many little time. And, and are these data consistent with the equation? Are these data sufficient to get a unique solution? So you see, there is this issue that is A, is not clear what's the nature of the equation and how many boundary conditions you need. And then there's the other issue is whether the data available that provide boundary conditions, are they enough? Are they too many? Are they consistent? And so what we did is that we took this kuramoto sivashinsky space and time, providing data in these two space-time corridors and in initial conditions. So we have enough information to make this problem well posed. But in this part of the domain, the problem is not well posed. OK? You see, there is no boundary conditions up there. And so allow me to ask you, just for fun, if you solve this problem variationally, you're trying to make the residual, you discretize the problem, and you try to make the residual 0. And you solve it in a domain, part of which is well posed and part of which is not well posed. What would happen? In the places where the problem is well posed, you're going to find the same solution every time. In the places where the problem is not well posed, every time that you minimize with a different seed, you're going to find something else that satisfies the equation, but has no boundary condition to satisfy, so it does whatever it wants at the boundary. Am I coherent? So you look at the solutions, and you will see that all the solutions look absolutely the same in the middle, where the problem is we, we happen to know that the problem is well posed. We made it so. But then up here, we find different things. They all solve the equation. And so I am going to now claim that we, I mean, it's very childish, but it's actually fun. What we're going to do is that we're going to study the many not good solutions and figure out in a data-driven way, where is it that the problem is well posed and where is it that it's not? In the problem where there is a big variance of the solutions, obviously the problem is not well posed because we don't find the same thing again and again. Let me make sense of this in a very small problem. ODs. Suppose that you think of a linear second order equation. You know that to make this well posed, you need two conditions, two initial conditions, two boundary conditions, something. Yes? Well, two internal conditions. So what we do is that we discretize this equation and we solve it variationally. We're just asking to find a formula that minimizes the residuals over the domain that we are solving without knowing anything about well-posedness. We give it lots of different random initializations and we minimize the residuals. What do we find? In this case, we gave one condition here that the solution passes from one point. And we find a whole bunch of solutions. Sure, it's not well posed. Here's the one fun part. You take the solutions and you analyze them. And you find that they are a one parameter family of solutions. You have one initial condition. You're missing another one. Therefore, you're going to find the one. And therefore, a data analysis. I know it sounds childish, but it's not that trivial. If you analyze the many solutions you find, you're going to figure out how many boundary conditions you're missing. One here. And so back to PDEs, let me show you something that, again, it's simple, but I like it very much. So this is the wave equation. And in class, we all learned how to have well-posed problems for solving the wave equation, one space and one time dimension. And now here, I'm telling you that I'm going to give you data that solves the equation in some part of the domain with nothing else for initial or boundary conditions. And here's a twist of the problem. I'm going to give you data that solves the equation in one part of the domain 
And in some part of the domain, I will give you a, a reflective boundary condition. And now I'm going to solve this horribly posed problem many, many times variation. You have enough information to guess what you're going to find. This is what you're going to find. But just look at these two slides on the top. When you're given data here and you solve, you're going to find the same solution always within this. Do you see this uh, ROM area? Why? Because everything in here has two characteristics. Now, we know this because we know something about the wave equation. If you and everywhere else, we're going to find something different every time we solve. If you solve the problem with the boundary condition and data here, then you're going to find always the same solution here, here, and here. Because if you look at it carefully, you will see that there are two characteristics, again, there. So this is a very st stupid but interesting way to looking at the problem. I solve the problem many times. I process the bad solutions. And from processing the bad solutions, I can understand something about the nature of the problem. Yes? That's not completely trivial. And. Um, let me just tell you that we have systematic ways of figuring out what are parts, by looking at the richness of the solutions, if you want the cardinality of the solution, we can figure out where are there places we, where we are missing two or one or none information to have a unique solution. Um, I can maybe more or less, okay, let me just say a couple of simple things. I told you that we can look at the richness of the possible solutions, which tell us how many boundary conditions were missing in how many parts of the domain. And this is the same thing that was a that was just linear finite difference. If you go to nonlinear solvers, you find the same thing. That if you prescribe data here, you know, and you use neural networks as basis functions to solve the problem, you're going to again find that the same is the place where you get the same solution. And then you can look at the variance of the solutions. Again, here you see here is the same area. And then here is this corridor and this corridor. You look at the variance of the solutions in these places, and it tells you something about the, in a hidden way, it's telling you that characteristics exist. It's kind of interesting, and I don't know exactly how to do it in a fair way. Can I process these data and kind of figure out that there is this concept of characteristics, uh, but this sounds both, um, if you put it in, you will find it, but if you don't put it in, what would it take to find it, yes? And of course, the same thing happens with the Kuramoto-Sivasinski. Let me tell you one last thing, and then I want, okay, in the problem that I told you, the problem was underprescribed. Yes, we were missing boundary conditions. Let me just say, that if you have too many boundary conditions, then it turns out that in the optimization world, there is very well studied algorithms to figure out if you have too many constraints, how many constraints do you have to kill for the problem to have its a, a solution? So there is ways of thinking about the under constraint problem and there's good ways of thinking about the over constraint problem. How would you figure out how many of your equations, your boundary conditions are not there? Let me also say that this is a very good place to play with randomized linear algebra. There is, we have a good friend, Lisa Rebrova in Princeton, and then we use CutSmart's algorithms for figuring out randomly how many of the things you would have to throw out. It's just a nice connection. Okay, these are the two vignettes that I wanted to tell you, and now I want to finish. And uh, uh, in my opinion, one of the, the, in my humble opinion, the most important thing about data science and machine learning is that it allows us to work not only with the forms of a problem that we understand, but with equivalent invertible transformations of the problem, even if we don't exactly know what the variables are in that Latin space and what the operators are in that Latin space. So we can look at all possible, all possible translations, all possible invertible translations of our problem. So a few years ago, while I still was in Princeton, Jhumpa Lahiri, whom you may know, she has a Pulitzer Prize and she wrote the, the namesake and the interpreter of Malady. She, she one day decided to start write, writing in Italian. 
And there was this little book that came out when I was in Princeton, and that's why she signed it. She, she was in a bookstore and signing copies for it. And the, the book was called In Other Words, in Altre Parole. And the book on the one page had her Italian, and on the other page had the translation by another translator. And this was a book about how difficult it is to write idioms in a foreign language. How it's very easy in Greek for us to say something and much easier in Italian to say something else and in English to say something else. And if you think about it, this is a problem of good conditioning. There exists a transformation, but the transformation is very close to singular in places where something very special happens in one language that doesn't happen in the other. I hope I make a little sense in what I am telling you. There's places where translation is very easy and places where translation is very difficult. The places that translation is very difficult are bad conditioning places for us. So she writes this book and this book is 140 brilliant prose about how difficult it is sometimes to translate something from a language to each other, okay? And I read the book, I read the 10 pages and the 20 pages and the 40 pages, and it is exquisite, but I'm a Philistine engineer. At some point I get, okay, I get it. And before I put the book down, I go to the, I, is there an afterword? Is there something at the end? And I go to the afterword and it floors me. It says, I'll read you a little. In 1939, 15 years before he died, Henri Matisse began to move away from traditional painting and develop a new artistic technique. It involved cutting up pieces of paper that had been painted in gouache in various colors. Matisse then combined and arranged the different pieces to create an image. You see, these are Latin spaces. They're pixels on a computer. He fixed the elements first with pins, then with paste, often directly over the wall. He stopped using the easel, the canvas. His main tool became a pair of scissors rather than the brush. So I read this, and to me, it looks like a wonderful analogy with what we do when we do data-driven modeling. The method, a sort of synthesis of collage and mosaic, arose out of limitations. Why do we do it? Because there's things we cannot do in, other, in the usual way that are very difficult to do in a usual way. The eyesight of the 70-year-old painter had greatly deteriorated. After a serious illness, he used a wheelchair. He was forced to stay in bed. And one day he wanted to make a garden in the house, an exuberant jumble of leaves and fruit to the walls. And it was a collective process. Matisse had the graduate students paint the paper. He was not able to execute his work by himself for older professors like me. We, you, I feel this often. The result was a distinctive form, a hybrid style, notably more abstract than his painting. I'm not going to read the whole book, just two more paragraphs. The images were more simplified, crude compared to the ones on canvas, but they required painstakingly complex workmanship. No, nobody said that doing machine learning is trivial, okay? Uh, one recognizes the hand and the eye of the painter, but they have changed. We follow the thread between the new method and the earlier paintings, and we are aware of a turning point, a radical move. Last paragraph, for Matisse, cutting, data science, machine learning, was not only a new technique, but a system for thinking about and expanding the possibilities of shape and color and composition and modeling and algorithms. A rethinking of his artistic slash scientific strategy. The painter said the conditions of this journey are 100% different. He compared his method, which he called painting with scissors, modeling with data, to the experience of flying. So a few years ago, I read this to Rafi Koifman, my, my, my mentor and friend and idol. He said, oh, but we have codes that do that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. And uh, do we have questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was a great talk. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so I have a I have two questions. Um, so initially, when you started out, uh, you were discussing methods that were um, sort of, they were not uh, trying to use neural networks as distinct surrogates. They were trying to incorporate that into the traditional modeling yes, exercises. But I did also claim that if you look at some of the architectures that people are using, they 
seem to be doing that a little bit right yeah yeah, yeah. i i mean I, i've worked a little bit on that so i was just sort of curious what your thoughts are between the uh, the expressivity of those techniques where you're trying to incorporate the the neural networks to just capture uh, unknown dynamics and whereas in pins where you are trying to create surrogates for the the nonlinear dynamics using neural networks and okay uh, I, it's a long story and i don't know to what extent i get the ramifications of the question in my mind doing pins is doing Galerkin with a different set of basis functions. Mm -hmm. The fact, I, I hope I'm not offending anybody or my friend George. Now, the fact, in my mind, the, the fact that makes the big difference is that in my time, God help me, writing Galerkin with triangular basis functions took a year of studying or some months of studying. And these days, doing Galerkin with neural network basis functions is three lines in PyTorch. And the fact that there is this facility, not with the idea, but with the tools, allows for much more experience, thinking, and so on and so forth. That's one statement. The other statement is that I personally think this is a, per and that I do try to work in this, is that if the architecture is not an arbitrary black box, big architecture, but a, I don't know if there's any of the chemical engineers that do design. If, if when you do the optimization of the architecture, you choose superstructures that already, I'm just telling you, you know, that are already infused with some of the things that we know, then the search becomes easier, faster, maybe a little more interpretable. So I really didn't answer, but you see what my thoughts are on both cases. Yeah, yes. I, I... Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, really nice talk. You show these beautiful examples of problems where <clears throat> the data is seemingly complex, and yet there is a latent space where it's no longer yeah. that complex, which exhibits smoothness or other nice properties. And you mentioned, you know, uh, I interpret it as a, as a challenge. You know, find the latent space where the behavior of your system is linear or Hamiltonian. My question is whether there are uh, existence proofs that such spaces exist yeah. given an arbitrary yeah 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 fair thank you uh, okay uh, first i will tell you something religious and then i will tell you something scientific you know be, being old and gray i think that the problems that we can solve are problems that if we knew how to look at them they would be simple Th that doesn't mean that the problems are simple but th there is levels at which we can usefully for us thinking them as simple. For example, this is a rather macabre uh, example. I don't know if, I hope I will be, but I don't know if I will be alive and well exactly a year from now. But if you think of, you know, 63 old white males of a certain way, you have a pretty good idea of the probability of them being alive. People make their livelihood from selling life insurance. What I mean by this is maybe the problem does not close usefully at the level that is of interest to you, but there is maybe other levels at which the problem closes usefully. So the, the use of the modeling is very important. At the level of the age of the universe, everything will be dead, but we are not interested that far. So the, the question is, when does something usefully close? If it closes uselessly, then we don't talk about it. If it doesn't close at all, then we know that we cannot be predicted. Uh, trying to turn my macabre example into something cuter, I was discussing recently with a friend and says, of course, this is the wedding planning problem. I said, what do you mean this is the wedding planning problem? He said, well, if I plan my sister's wedding, which I'm doing now, I know that I roughly need 250 people. It's not clear that you will come and I will come, but plus minus we invite a few more. I'm just trying to, to, to again say the same simple thing. Something should usefully close. And the important thing is, find the level at which it closes. And I think that if it doesn't usefully close, then we don't talk about it. But um, 
you understand this is not a very scientific answer, but I, I believe. Yes. Uh, thanks for the great talk. So I was wondering if um, if you ever look into like it, so if the transformations that you're using to get to some latent space where you uh -huh. then learn the dynamics, if those are um, like invertible and then yeah 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 good. I, I promised you something um, scientific and something blah, and I only told you the blah. Here's the scientific. Thanks for asking. This I I realized this like I don't know three, four years ago, and I, I, I really like wanted to cry or laugh with myself. You, I hope it's not politically incorrect. You agree with me, we have this saying, either a lady is pregnant or is not pregnant, one of the two. This is not politically incorrect to say, right? Okay. So you would say either a system is Hamiltonian or is not Hamiltonian, yes? Either a system is integrable or is not integrable, yes? Wrong. John Guggenheimer, who is a friend and from whose book I learned on dynamics, we were chatting a long time ago, and he said, Yanis, you, do you know the, the flow box theorem? I said, no. Turns out it has many names. The flow box theorem says, take a membrane and draw a nonlinear vector field on the membrane. Then, unless you're close to a singularity, you can deform the membrane so that the vector field is parallel and constant which tells you that locally there exists a transformation for any bloody system in the world that has n minus one conservation laws and where everything is nice, perfect. Physically, there exist local gauge transformations for a lot of things. Now, what if you, the vector field is bigger and bigger and bigger. So what happens is that everything is, I'm overdoing it for the sake of, whatever, everything is locally integrable. But as you make the transformation bigger and bigger and bigger, where are the obstacles? What is the nature of the obstacles? So what I really am trying to tell you is that, why is this science? The way that I'm telling you, it's conceptual. You'll be look and search, and but you see, for those of you that play with nonlinear dynamics, the basis of everything we learned in school is normal forms. Any system close to a Hopf bifurcation can be mapped to this little two-term, three-term polynomial dynamical system. There exists a transformation that locally takes you from here to here. That's all we ever learned, that the transformation exists and therefore it shows. And then farther away, who the hell knows? You know, it's like there be dragons. The thing that's important, in my opinion, is that now solving the functional equations that construct the transformations that will tell you how far you can go and how it fails is, as I was telling you before, three lines of a Python code. So while up to now we could never really try and study up to where is something integrable, not globally, but you know, now it's doable. So I personally, for my own work, I think it's a very exciting place to try and find out. I was talking with Professor Strang before. You can define what you consider as beauty. Is it compactness? Is it uh, interpretability? Is it uh, linearity? Is it integral? And then try and find up to what, up to where things can be beautiful. When do they stop being beautiful? How do they stop being beautiful? And is there a way to do a sort of analytic continuation to, 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 to prolong beauty? I understand this sounds like blah, but, but it's not complete. Fair? OK, okay. thank and you. There is one more question online. Yes. So let me okay. read that quickly, hopefully. So uh, thank you for the great talk. Given many time series channels collected from a single system, how can we build the Latin space? And what is the metrics? of beauty in this example? Okay, the, the, the fair answer is e e e email me or call me and we can discuss, but uh, what I showed you today is taking time series and then doing data mining of the time series as if every time series was a data point and then trying and find the dimensionality of a nice embedding of not the points, but the time series. Um, I have more to say, 
this is just uh, but 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 and and please email me I'm, as you see i'm happy to talk until the evening yeah okay thank you very much uh, yanni okay